Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would, it, that would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth a stream, a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Just right. I also wanna give a huge thanks to my Patreon subscribers. And it's because of them that I'm able to do this free. It's actually a rather expensive hobby when you factor in all of the all of the software and stuff that goes into this. So a huge thanks to my Patreon subscribers for supporting this work. And if you'd like to join them for as little as a dollar a month, you can click the link in the description below. And uh, again, in addition to you know helping to support this uh, support this content, you will have access to ad-free videos, early access to those videos. I'll be I'll be uploading another video, a Patreon video. Well, uploading another video 
uh, next week, which will be available on my YouTube channel the following week, but you will have early access to that video as a Patreon subscriber as well as other other educational uh, other educational materials. So I want to get into the current uh, topic, which is life on the slaveholding South, the cultural survival strategies. I will be taking a live uh, Q and A. And so if you have questions about the video that just premiered or about this presentation that I'm doing right now, um, please feel free to uh, put those questions in the chat. I'm sorry about the audio issues uh, earlier, but uh, looks like they're resolved. Uh, looks like they're resolved now. Uh, super chats are enabled if you're feeling generous and want to support. Um, obviously, super chats will be pushed to the top of the of the of the line. But um, your support is very much appreciated, not uh, obligatory. So I'll be able I'll be answering as many questions as uh, as I can. But let's talk about so the the video that just premiered. Hopefully that you got a chance to check out at three o'clock was specific to slave plantations. And I'm going to elaborate on a couple of points that I that I sort of touched on, but didn't go into detail, uh, deep detail. Those videos really are, are intended as a starting point, sort of a jumping off point. And it's intended for folks to use also in the classroom and they can kind of go, I, I've left it deliberately open so that they can go, folks can go where they want to go with those with those videos. I'm gonna elaborate on a couple of points that I didn't really go into detail on. Uh, in that in that particular video. So I'm going to talk about setting. And as I do that, and I'm talking about cultural survival strategies, I should probably define what I mean by culture. Culture is beliefs, practices, and modes of being of a particular people in a particular setting adopted as a means of survival, right? So the reason why people do the things they do. So setting matters. And so I was talking about the plantation south in the premiere video, but obviously, as you can see in the picture here, that's that's uh, Louisiana, actually. It's a port city. It's a more urban area. And we have a very, very different setting. And so much of what I'm going to be doing here is to be contra is to contrast what's going on in the deep south plantations with, and, and I'm going to be contrasting it with, say, some of these urban settings. One of the things that I talked about in the video is about 90% of slaves lived on plantations or farms or farms. Not all of them were cotton plantations. Some of them were tobacco, some of them were wheat, some of them were sugar, rice, etc. So 90% on plantations, but not all of them cotton plantations. Most what no matter what the setting is, most work from sun up to sundown, or as, as some folks say, from can to can't, from when you can see in the morning to when you can't see at night. And to get somebody to do that requires sheer a level of brutality that's almost unimaginable. I like to refer to the slave trade and slavery as abysmal. And when I say that, you know, even I as a professor who've been doing this for 20 years, the more I look at this institution, the deeper it gets in terms of the amount of, of brutality that it takes to get somebody to do that. You're never going to get to the bottom of that. Uh, there's just layer after layer after layer of brutality that that enforces this system of slavery. And again, that's regardless of the setting. People had different strategies of dealing with it, but regardless of setting, that's generally going to be the case. About 75% were field workers. So not all of the slaves that lived on the plantations were necessarily field workers. About 75% were field workers. Again, not all of them cotton. I think it was about 50 or 55% that were on cotton plantations. So cotton is the mainstay of the economy. Over 50% of the country's exports by 1860 were in cotton. So a huge amount, a huge chunk, more than half the country's economy was in cotton directly on the backs of slaves. And about 5% worked in industry. So one of the contrasts that we're going to see on the plantation is in a setting like a setting like this, which is more urban, you have the you have a number of people that you have a more diverse group that you have contact with. So I would imagine there are plenty of free blacks in this, and I say that in air quotes, 
uh, free blacks, um, non-enslaved blacks, I guess would be a better description, uh, mixed in with this, with this picture, especially since it's New Orleans, but urban settings tended to have a higher number of not enslaved blacks than the plantation South did. And New Orleans had the highest number of non enslaved blacks than any Southern city. So there, um, there's almost certainly some free black folks intermixed in this picture as well as enslaved black folks. That's one of the sort of features of the urban setting as opposed to the plantation setting where you're really stuck on the plantation. It's a kind of a world unto itself and you don't have this wider contact with, uh, with folks in neighboring plantations. And you actually have to devise strategies in order to do that, in order to, in order to slip on and slip off that we'll actually talk about, we'll actually talk about here. Um, again, there are, there are some differences in terms of how people communicate. There are some differences in the way folks work in this particular setting. Generally speaking, you're going to see folks who are given a task, in this case, probably load or unload the ship or a series of things to do. And again, in this particular setting, the survival strategy is you want to get through that task as quickly as you can, because if you can get through that task, perhaps you can hire yourself out for wages. You know, hey, I'm done unloading the ship. Can I, you know, give, give me a nickel and I'll, and I'll help you unload that ship. And over time, accumulate monies to secure your freedom through self-purchase, right? That's one of the ways that you can, that, that you can, that you can, uh, that you can take advantage of this particular setting. That wasn't necessarily so on the cotton plantations of the deep south. So they had to devise, whereas here, your strategy is to work as fast as you can. For the most part, if you're on the plantations, your strategy is going to be around working as slowly as you possibly can, right? So we're gonna talk about how people did that while you have somebody 16 hours a day standing over you with a whip. You have to devise strategies for that. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I chose this picture very deliberately because it also gets it speaks to the the both the idealism that slave slave owners had towards slavery and the way in which some black folks took advantage of that as part of the survival strategy. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. But but again, these slaves look happy. They're on the plantation. They're picking cotton. Again, that belies a a very complex set of of survival strategies that they had that they had adopted. All right. So let's talk about the setting. It's a rural setting. They're working from can to can't, from when you can see in the morning to can't see at night. I talked about that in the in the video that just premiered. Severe physical punishment, again, Solomon Northup talked about that in great detail, which was, again, goes along with the type of setting that, 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 that they were in. You can't get somebody to, to, to work that kind of hours and do that sort of physical labor with, for free without a severe physical punishment. But when I talk about setting, I'm not just talking about the physical setting, I'm talking about the ideological layout. What did the slave owners believe of their slaves, right? And how might these enslaved blacks take advantage of that? So these slave owners believed that, they, and they were often depicted, that these slaves were de often depicted as childlike, right? Like children. And they were depicted or thought of as lazy, unintelligent, clumsy, but also happy, right? They did a good sell job on that. So there are ways in which you can take it. If, if this is what the slave owner believes, there are ways that you can take advantage of that. If, if, the, if the slave owner, so we talked about, for example, in the, in the, in the premiere, one of the things that, that enslaved blacks did was they would, they would break tools they would injure animals, sometimes leave the barn door open so that the animals would escape. You know, how do you get away with that? Um, well, one of the things that they did was that they were really good at selling was, you know, hey, the slave owner thinks I'm clumsy, so I'm going to play the part, right? Oops, accidentally broke that tool. Uh, you know how we Negroes are, right? 
Um, oops, uh, did I leave the barn door open? Uh, you, you know how us black, you know how us Negroes are, sir. You know, it's, 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 just, uh, it's just the way we are, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna play that up as much as you can. Um, and of course, that you're not going to let on your true feelings about how you feel about being a slave. And of course, th that would not be a very good survival strategy, would it? If somebody's standing over you with a whip asking you how you feel about slavery, what had better your answer be? Right. So, so, so slave bell hooks talked about this in her book. We real cool. Black folks got really good at being cool, right? We cool boss. So to, to a certain extent, it even became maladaptive, meaning that it had, it, 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 there's a lot of discussion about what's called the health slave deficit. Um, all things being equal, you take diet, you take education, you take lifestyle. Black folks are going to suffer from stress-related diseases at higher rates than white folks. Hypertension, heart attack, uh, diabetes, uh, stroke, etc. And a lot of that is because black folks got really good at being cool. And that takes a toll, right? There was a reason why we got good at that. Our survival depended on being cool. But at, at a certain point, it even actually became maladaptive. Right. So black folks, slaves are taking advantage of what the slave owner already believes. Right. And they're doing a good sell job. And we know that they're doing a good sell job because if you look at some of the accounts of slave owners themselves, uh, as a matter of fact, I did a live stream and a, and a video a few weeks back on on firsthand accounts of of slavery and the difference between white and black abolitionists. You know, one of the one of the things that we talked about in that in that video was there was actually a slave owner who had tracked down one of his former slaves by the name of Jordan Anderson, asking him. This was in you know just after this, or actually during this, I think it was in 1864, had tracked down one of his slaves that had been emancipated by the Union Army, and had asked him to come back and work for him. And the the response that this that this former slave gave was priceless. It was a very snarky response. But just the fact that this slave owner would ask this guy to come back and work for him and expect him to do it tells you that the, the these slaves did a really good job of selling the idea. Oh, we're happy. Why would I want to leave? You know, we're happy here, boss. And and you can see other accounts that it's, it's astonishing, it's always astonishing me, and I should have brought some of these accounts actually, but you can see from the slave owners themselves how astonished they were during the Civil War that when these slaves got an opportunity to run away, when these slaves saw the Union Army marching over the hill, they bounced, right? And, and you can see this in the accounts of slave owners themselves, how astonished they were at that. Right. And it was often those slaves that they thought most loyal that were the first ones to bounce. Um, they got played. You know, they also you see in the accounts of slaveholders themselves, for, for example, you know, telling, you know, explaining to black folks over and over again how to use a wheelbarrow to turn it the right side up. I mean, come on, you're getting played. Right. Uh, so so black folks did a really, really good idea of selling the idea of 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 um, playing into the ideology or the the concept that slave owners already had of them. It also became a dual-edged sword because, in some sense, it became part of the justification for slavery, right? Because they played the role so well, a lot of a lot of these Southern whites were like, "No, we can't we can't emancipate these slaves. What would they do without us? They're so childlike and and, and unintelligent and clumsy." And so in that sense, it was a bit of a dual-edged sword, but they did a good, the point is it, it became that way because their survival depended on it. It became a part of the culture because their survival depended on it. And, and, and unlike slaves or enslaved blacks in the rural areas, they had to learn to communicate in a different way, right? You had somebody standing over you 16 hours with a whip. Whereas in the urban areas you had, for example, um, the, the, the uh, ability to, to communicate without in, in semi-private. You had actually formal churches, for example, and I'm going to advance this here. You had formal churches as opposed to these sort of informal gatherings here. 
most famously probably was uh, Emmanuel Bethel Baptist Church, which is where the 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 uh, Dylan Roof um, had had uh, shot up that church. But that was actually the, the church where the Denmark Vesey rebellion had been planned. That's the, that was the same church in South Carolina. So it's actually four walls and a roof where yourself and other members of the community, both enslaved and free blacks, could could meet and congregate. And it's the, that that that's the that's the perfect sort of setting where you where it was possible to plan an uprising. Whereas you don't see that so much on these deep south plantations because your survival depends on being able to speak covertly, uh, to play the role, uh, and you don't really have an opportunity to speak in private or even co kind of coordinate from plantation to plantation. So their resistance is going to take a bit of a different form, uh, much more covert, much more subversive. They played the role well. They spoke in code. Um, we talked in the in the previous in the previous in the in the premiere that just premiered at, at, at three o'clock. Uh, hopefully you got a chance to see it. It talked about Br'er Rabbit and, and how, you know, these, these critical life lessons were taught through animal trickster tales. And again, it was a way of, of communicating how to survive and how to navigate this through coded language. And also clearly most famously was the spirituals. And I talked about this on my video on the African roots of black music. Here we have one of the, one of the more better known spirituals, Steal Away. And again, black folks did a good job of selling this idea that, oh, we're not, we're not talking about run away, running away. You know, why would we want to do that? No, no, we're talking about, we just can't wait to get to heaven, you know? Um, but you know what you're talking about. And the slave owners knew what they were, what, what the slaves knew what they were talking about. And they relied on the slave owners thinking that the slaves were too dumb to, to, to get it, that, uh, that, and also happy being there, that they would never dream of running away. And again, we see the evidence of that in the slave owners themselves and how astonished they were that these slaves would actually run away. It's, it's, it's astonishing to me how astonished they were. But again, here we have some of the lyrics of these, uh, of the spiritual. And as we talked about before, again, you can often see the code here in the last stanza, right? Now you have a different type of maroon largely on these, on these plantations. This is next week when I release the Patreon video in a couple of weeks from now, while well, released on video on, on, on YouTube, I'm going to talk about the Underground Railroad. This generally isn't where the Underground Railroad operated. The Underground Railroad operated in the Upper South, places, places like Maryland, places like Virginia, uh, in the border states. But this is the Deep South. There's really nowhere to run. That's not to say that slaves didn't run away, but it's a different type of maroon. Maroon meaning runaway slave. Generally speaking, they're slipping on, slipping off and slipping back on. Generally speaking, some of them are, are, are creating what are called maroon communities, which are these sort of out of the way communities of runaway slaves back in the swamps and the hard to, hard to get to places. They tended to be, these maroon communities tended to be temporary because it was a very, very difficult life. And so oftentimes these maroons were temporary. Maybe you wanted to slip off the plantation to visit a, neighbor, a loved one on a neighboring plantation, for example, right? So again, these it's, it's clear here that we have a set of instructions on where and when and, and how to slip off that plantation. I mean, look at the look at the lyrics. The Lord calls me by the thunder. The Lord calls me by the lightning. When's the best time to slip off that plantation undetected and slip back on? Right. Um, so uh, again, these are temporary maroons who developed a developed a culture and, and a way of communicating that facilitated their survival in that particular setting. So again, mo for the most part you can find the code in the last line of the stanza each the last line of each stanza i ain't got long to stay here right again if you're talking to the slave owner we're talking about oh i'm 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 going to heaven right but that's not what you're really talking about so i want to just pose this real real quick here um 
This is another example of one of the spirituals. And I'm going to read the last line of this, of this uh, particular spiritual and maybe put in the comments what you think is being communicated here, right? Look at that, look at that last, uh, oh yes, yes, exactly. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but yes, that's exactly why, um, oh, I'll get to J Julie's comment in just a second. Um, but uh, let me get, let me just read this last line, the last line of this, uh, of this stanza. And not, <laughs> listen to what I'm saying and not, not necessarily the words and not turn her back on the gaining ground and not turn her back on the graining on the gaining ground put in the comments what you think i'm saying right and not turn her back on the gaining ground let me address while you're while you're doing that let me address uh, julie's comment um, the Maroons in the Caribbean in Brazil had it, uh, had it better and had a better chance to run away. Yes, there are still communities in Brazil that have maintained their essentially independence, right? And haven't, are just barely now being incorporated back into, into Brazil. But these are very hard to get to places, largely because the terrain was so, was so rugged. Um, they were very isolated. They were able to maintain those communities and also more famously, uh, uh, we have the maroon communities in Haiti, who, again, very I mean, Haiti's got a small stretch of of arable land around the coast, but it gets mountainous really quick, and it's hard to penetrate. And so you had the that's one of the reasons why Vodou is so widely varied in Haiti, because these maroon communities where where Vodou was you know this blending of Roman Catholicism and African religion, they did it in different ways, depending upon these different pockets of, of, of people. So there's a wide variance of how it was practiced. It, also depending upon the composition of the Maroon community, whether, whether it was more the Homi dominated or more Yoruban dominated, um, that, that's gonna be a factor as well. So, let's see. yeah. So um, any, any takes on what's being communicated here? And not, I almost said it, and that, and not turn her back on the gaining ground, right? Let me let me let me come back to that. So again, let me just okay. We don't need that anymore. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, I can take questions, or if you have. Um, if you have any thoughts on what was being communicated in that last stanza and not turn her back on the gaining ground, what does that mean? Again, listen to the sound and not necessarily the words, right? Um, to understand what the code is. Um, and also if you have other, other questions, comments, um, I'll be uploading again in a couple of weeks and the, the video that I'm gonna be uploading is gonna focus on the Upper South, and it's also gonna take into account California. So I'll be talking about folks like James Beckworth. I'll be talking about folks like Mary Ellen Pleasant. They had a very tough life, but they adapted very, very differently. Uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in that upcoming video, they were able to essentially negotiate with their slave owner a term of years to to um, I think it was usually about a term of seven years, where they would they would work, they would be leased out essentially, and the, the wages would go to the would go to the slave owner, and after that, they would be manumitted, right? Oftentimes, slaves were able to negotiate that, and the reason they were able to negotiate that is because they were in the Upper South and the Underground Railroad was active there, and so you had an assurance that hey, I'm not going to bounce, but I'll work for you for seven years. And, and um, you know, how about you just manumit me after that? And I'll go into more detail of, on that in the next one. Uh, Julie says, maybe don't turn your back, keep looking forward. Yes, that's the, that's the overt message. I mean, it, it literally says that, not turn, her, not turn your back on the gaining ground. It actually says, and not turn her, not turn her back on the gaining ground, right? 
Um, that's the, the overt message, but what's the covert message there? And why her? Why not turn her back? Not turn her back on the gaining ground. Again, listen to what that sounds like and not what the actual words are. Uh, thank you, Loris. Uh, deep historical analysis in a second. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I, re I really appreciate that. And again, this is one of those topics that that we kind of scratch the surface of sometimes, but because this is such a, what I call an abysmal institution, it does take a, take a deep dive. And I haven't even really scratched the surface of it yet. I mean, if, if we could talk about uh, the impact on women and how they, they suffered an additional layer of, of exploitation. Angela Davis talks about that in her book, excellent book, which you can get online actually for free. It's called Women, Race, and Class. Uh, an excellent view of the additional layer that black women experienced as women. And, and again, even when we're talking about the Underground Railroad, there were things that, that impacted women differently. Especially, it's, it's especially dangerous to run away if you have children that, are, that, that you don't have any control over whether or not they're gonna give away your position, right? If they're, if they're crying or, or whatever, um, that's, that's, it, was, it was particularly dangerous for them. And, but also because of the constant fear of breakup of families, which often was, the, was, was what prompted uh, folks to run away because of that internal slave trade, you had an additional pressure of, you know, I got I to gotta go now. I can't wait seven years for my, for my slave owner to, to, to free me. Um, that was a dangerous choice because even if you made it to the North, you would be a fugitive the rest of your life. At any moment, you could be hauled back because of the Fugitive Slave Act. You could be hauled back into slavery, right? Uh, and you can't testify on your own behalf. So very, very dangerous game. Um, so then the, then the survival question becomes, do I negotiate a, a sort of um, a contract where I'll, I'll work for you for seven years and then after that you free me? Um, or if there's a threat of you being sold down the river, that might change your choice, right? And so that, again, I'll be talking about that next week. Uh, so Patreon members will get that, that video uh, a week from today. Uh, and a, a week following for my YouTube audience. Uh, any other thoughts and not turn her back on the gaining ground? Did somebody, uh, did somebody lead a slave revolt that you might want to talk about without your slave owner knowing that that's what you're talking about? And not turn her back on the gaining ground. I know there's a bit of a delay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off for a second before I give it away. Say it loud to yourself, and not turn her back on the gaining ground. Hmm. If you say it, not Tubman, not Tubman. Uh, that was Julie, not Tubman. Uh, but let me put this back up here for a quick second, and it becomes and Nat Turner back on the gaining ground. Nat Turner, right? Again, you want to be careful when saying that name, don't you? Um, and this is one of those things that Black folks got real good at. Uh, they got very good at dissembling. They got very good at speaking in ways um, that that the slave owner that you could speak right in front of the slave owner and not have that slave owner know what you're talking about, right? There's a reason why black folks are good at that and it has to do with our very survival. Um, so I wanna thank you all for joining me today and invite you to, to, to subscribe. I'm not able to, to upload you know, every week. Hopefully at some point I'll be able to do that, but um, it's, it's, it's a one person operation and I, and I so appreciate my, Patreon subscribers for supporting that. It's um, it's made a world of difference in terms of my being able to do this, um, you know, just with the software 
uh, and up the quality of it. Um, but even just Restream alone, which I'm using right now, um, it's it's an it's an expensive hobby, but it's one that I want to make sure uh, to get this material out because I do think that this material should be free, and also because a lot of folks aren't comfortable teaching online, and I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for folks who may be just moving on to an online format. Um, but I do want to thank you again for joining me. I will be back in a couple of weeks. And until then, I'll see you in the comments.